do we start with the confessions? Because there is no healing without forgiveness. There is no healing. If you see in the gospel, normally it's always linked the forgiveness of sins with the healing. In such a way that whenever you allow the Lord to restore you entirely from the inside, then it's very easy for him to do whatever he wants to do in our lives. But to understand what forgiveness means, we really have to go to the basics. And to the basics, it means we need to know the structure of a gift. When we go through parish missions, always sister says, please tell them about this gift and the three characteristics of the gifts, because I think it's something that we all need to re-hear. No? Seneca said that the obvious things, when we don't remember, when we don't remind them, we don't live them. So let's start with this. I'm going to ask you these questions, especially for those who are at the back or are late. Those are the ones I'm going to ask more. So be ready. Now, I would like to know who would know the three characteristics of a gift. For a gift to be a gift, it has three characteristics. What would be the characteristics of a gift to be a gift? Who could tell me one? It's free. It's free. Nobody can oblige you to give a gift, okay? If somebody is obliging you, it's not inside of the structure of a gift. It's inside of uh, the structure of someone that you, uh, that you did for them to give you something, for example. And it's not, it doesn't have to be anything bad. If you work for someone, your boss is not free to pay you or not. He has to pay you. But that's a different structure. For a gift to be a gift, nobody can oblige you. This is beautiful because then it means it's not under our control. It's something that either the other person wants or there's no gift. Okay? Now, what's the second characteristic of a gift? Nothing in return. Nothing in return. Nothing in return means the only. So why, why would I then, if I can't give you anything in return, what's the reason of me giving you a gift? The only reason is love. No? Only because I love you. Now, this is the second one. This is a very good one. So the first one, it's free. Second, out of love. Out of love. There can't be any other reason. Okay? What's the third one? Be accepted. Exactly. Now, that's not an easy one. Being a, be accepted means there has to be someone ready to receive it. I can be the whole day wanted to do like this and give you a gift, but if you don't want to receive it, it's impossible. Now, let's see this three. Okay, free. No one can oblige you. This is, eh, this is what it is, no? Second, the only reason is love. There's not other reasons. Now, this for us men is mind-blowing, okay? Ready for this? Now, why do you give flowers to your wife? <laughs> you know why? <laughs> because they are useless. Not your wives, the flowers. Now, this is important. <laughs> <laughs> the flowers are useless. You cannot use them for anything. They're just an expression of the beauty that can only be set today because probably tomorrow the flowers won't survive. No? That was so hard for me to understand when I was 15 and I had a girlfriend. I was like, man, why don't you give her an iPad? <laughs> Something that less. I don't, I really didn't understand that the Lord was calling me to be a priest. That's why I didn't understand these things. But anyhow, why? Because they are useless. Because the only thing I want to tell you is that I love you. Full stop. Now I'm going to tease you a little bit more. Why would someone buy 
Why would someone ask Michelangelo to uh, do this beautiful sculpture of the piety in the Vatican? That's a lot of money. Why? Because it's useless. Because it only describes the beauty of a gift. It's not there to sell. It's not there for us to make money. It's just that someone decided he had seen so much beauty in God that he wanted to give that gift for the church to express the beauty. Now, some gifts that we give in the church are useless and they're supposed to be useless because they're gifts. They're there to express the beauty. They're there to express that humankind can present beauty for nothing, just out of love. And that's a huge, huge, huge scream of hope to the world. You know, when I saw your kids the other day, yesterday, singing here, what they were expressing was beauty. And that expresses hope. And that is an expression of love. Now tell me how many artists do you see nowadays in the world that are expressing beauty? Aren't we missing a little bit of love and a little bit of hope? Imagine the beautiful duty that we have in expressing that love. We are called to express beauty. We as Catholics are in the world to express that beauty just for nothing. Now, the third thing, someone capable of receiving it, to receive it, it's not easy at all. Now, why is it out of love? Because, now imagine the situation, okay? Your husband gives you a beautiful bouquet of roses, no? Now, in the evening, you have two options, either to go to your wife's house, a parent's house, just to see your parents-in-law, or tonight the buccaneers are playing. What would you do? Now your wife would say, let's go to my parents' house. You, you say, the buccaneers. My parents' house. The buccaneers. My parents' house. And then you look at your wife and you say, didn't you like the bouquet I gave you today? Is that a gift, yes or no? How do you call that? It's called sentimental blackmailing. That is not a gift. That is not a gift. That's important to know. Why? Because what you're saying there is, I didn't love you with those roses. I was bribing you. And that's hard. Now, that can block the third one, which is a very important one, which is to receive it. To receive is not easy, because it's an expression of our vulnerability. Yes, I need to be loved. Yes, I need to receive. I'm a creature. I was made to receive. I'm not that important. I need to receive from all of you. I'm very sad when I see people saying, this man, since he was little, he did everything on his own and he created an empire on his own. And I think, well, how sad and how false. At least he needed a plumber to go to the bathroom. No? We all need someone. We are all so connected that that vulnerability is not easy to express. Because then to receive, you need to express that you're needy. That I'm in need of your love. Now, there is a way to receive that it's important. So, for example, when I give you a pair of shoes, of brand new shoes, would I expect from you to go running to the shop and buy me a new pair of shoes, yes or no? No. What would be my biggest happiness? For me, for you to wear them, right? So, the only thing I'm expecting from you is put your new shoes 
and enjoy them, right? Now, why is this structure so important? Because I would love to ask you, what is the perfect gift? Who would know what the perfect gift is? Anyone arriving late want to tell what the perfect gift means? No? Okay, uh, the word in French, Italian and Spanish is very easy to learn, no? Because if you get the words from perfect, per, and then you get from the word gift, don, it says per don. What does perdon mean? Forgiveness. Perdon in Spanish, pardon in French, perdono in Italian, right? It means forgiveness is the perfect gift. Why? Because if we see the structure there where I messed up and I cannot come back, I can't turn to the past to fix it. There where I messed up, my only chance is for you to freely, to free? love me and for me to accept it that's my only chance let's go through them because they're very important first if you're here tonight be aware that the lord has taken his freedom to say yes i want to forgive you and if you don't believe me Look there. If you think your sin is bigger than how much he wants to risk everything for you, just tell me right now, looking at the cross, if you're not able to be forgiven by this man. So it can't be because he doesn't want to forgive us. It has to be because of the other two things. Now, the first thing, out of love, no? Now, let's put it the other way around. Your husband messes up big time, no? And he wants to go to the Buccaneers game, and you want to go to your parents' house, and he says, please forgive me yesterday, you know, I messed up big time. And you say, okay, I forgive you. So it comes the fight of buccaneers, my parents, buccaneers, my parents. And you look to your husband and you say, after what you did yesterday, do you really want to go to the buccaneers? Is that forgiveness, yes or no? No. How is that called? Sentimental blackmailing. And the next time your husband messes up big time, if he has a chance to hide it from you, will he hide it? Oh yes, he loves the buccaneers. He will. Why? Because if you say I forgive you and then it's not true, what you're saying is I didn't love you, I'm using it right now to win this conversation. Now, this can happen because we all make mistakes, but after using it to win that conversation, just come back and say, honey, I'm really sorry, I didn't mean that. You can go to the Buccaneers if you want, but I really want to love you. It's not fair that I did that to you, you know? Now, that's important. Now, the first one, it's free, but the freedom goes with something really important. Freedom means we need truth to be forgiven. There's no forgiveness without truth. Now, tell me if you would like this, no? Your husband comes home. Of course, always the husband is the bad guy, okay? So, husband comes home and see his wife, sees his wife really crossed. He looks and says, oh, what did I do now? No? And then he looks at his wife and the wife says, and, and he says to his wife, honey, Whatever I did, forgive me. Would you like that? That gets things even worse. <laughs> Why? Because you need to recognize what happened. If not, you're just saying whatever, you know? 
What if your husband said, you know what, yesterday I was really rude. I don't know what happened to me, I, I was stressed, but I really didn't mean it. Please forgive me, would you like that? Of course, no? Why am I saying this? Because if you do not come to a confessionary defenseless, you're not helping yourself. You will never experience forgiveness. Saint Faustina said that whenever she went to a confessionary, the first thing she did was to confess the thing that she was most ashamed of. Be aware that when we come to a confessionary, it has to be to confess our sins. There are many ways people come, you know. Sometimes you get someone and he, and he starts, you know what? My wife did this and did that and did this and did that. And I go like, well, why don't you tell her to come and I will give her the absolution, you know? <laughs> it's not about other people's sin. Don't tell other people's sins when you go into the confessionary. Just yours. Just yours. No. Some other people come and says, well, Father, maybe I did this. Maybe I did this. And maybe I did this. And then I go, well then, maybe the Lord forgives you. <laughs> no? Maybe. Why would you be afraid? You're seated at the throne of mercy. Our duty is to defend you. And it's not even Father Pablo. It's Jesus there sit sitting down. When I sit down in a confessionary, Father Pablo disappears. It's Jesus there defending you. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? Now, what is it with the truth that is so humbling that we really wanted to do it so good that we don't know if we, want, if we are going to be loved there? But try it. Some people are waiting here for years to tell something that they have been hiding for years and still didn't heal. Maybe today is the day when you will finally be healed. Because until now you still believe more in that sin than in his love. Maybe today, maybe tonight. Because you know, every time you go to a confessionary, you're just doing the biggest favor to the whole family. I'm restoring a husband down there. I'm restoring a wife down there for their children. Do you know the beauty of this? We're giving you back restored for you to go back home. Full stop. It's so hard sometimes to defend people in a confessionary who really don't want to be defended because they really think they're not going to be loved. Now, there's a third thing which is very important. How to receive the confession. There are two things that are really important. The first one, if you want to receive it, it means once you told your sins, please be very attentive to this. You have no right to blame yourself ever again for what happened. If you want to receive this gift, put your new shoes on and start dancing. Start that way, because it's so important. I remember I was in a parish and we had this naughtiest boy I've ever seen in my life. The naughtiest boy I've ever seen in my life. He was 14, he was borderline and he came just once to the parish, running away from the cops because he was getting some stones and throwing them to a house. And he just entered in the parish like this for the first time. So a catechist saw him and he started giving him catechesis and he was preparing and it was a mess. Because every time he came into the church, I had to tell all the ladies, please close your purses, Miguel is here. 
No? <laughs> he goes, imagine, no, a mess. But he started getting better. And so one day he was preparing for his first communion. And he had to come to do the first uh, confession. So he came, said all of his sins. After the absolution, I told him, aren't you happy? And he says, yes. Do you realize you're absolutely forgiven? Yes. Don't you feel like dancing? Yes. Isn't it like the best thing in the world? Yes. I said, okay. So now as a penance, do this and this and do it now if you want. So he goes out of the confessionary and they were praying the rosary. Going out of the confessionary, I see all of a sudden everyone stops the rosary and starts laughing. And I'm like, oh, what did Miguel do again? <laughs> he just came out of the first confessionary. What is he doing now? Open the door. Do you know what he was doing? He was dancing in front of the tabernacle. I started to cry, saying, my Jesus, when did I ever dance in front of you? that even Our Lady stopped the rosary for all of us to see this. When are we going to start dancing? When are you going to put your new shoes on after a confession? When are you going to stop blaming yourself from the past? You know, this story, uh, Father Eric asked me to tell it to you, but I had the chance to have a confession with uh, Padre Pierino, he, he's 95 years old now, and he was for 20 years with Padre Pio of Pietrelcina, you know the saint? Well, Padre Pio, big, big saint of the church, no? And this Padre Pierino has the same gift of seeing the heart. It's unbelievable. When, when I went to the confessionary, he was seeing all of my life. So, I went the first day and I said, he said, would you like a confession? And I said, yes. He started telling all of my sins and I'm like, mamma mia. I can't believe it. I was so overwhelmed. Every single sin. And I got so scared that it took three days for me to recover after that confession. No, so next year, I came back again and he's looking at me and saying, do you want a confession and I'm like okay <laughs> you know what I see and I said what and he says I see that you're beginning to follow Jesus so I looked at him and said wait 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 I would rather you tell me of all of those bad things you told me last year because it helped me a lot to put my feet on the ground so wouldn't you tell me all of those bad things he looks at me very serious and with a very serious face he says there's only one thing that saddens Jesus more than your sin and I said what and he says for you to remember what he already forgave you if you really want to come to the confessionary don't make Jesus sad. Start dancing. Start living. If you want to do a favor to your wife or to your husband or to your kids because you messed up big time, they need you restored. The Lord doesn't want you to be obliged to do anything. He loves who you are. He loves the real version of you, not the blamed version of you. He would love for you to be yourself again and start living. Why is it so hard? Why is it so hard? If you don't want to be the dream of God the Father, which is yourself, do not come to the confessionary. Because we can't defend you against you. Now, there's another part of receiving the gift, which is a very important one. Forgive us our trespasses as... 
There is no way that we can be forgiven if we don't forgive. We tie our Heavenly Father's hand when we do not forgive. You know why? Because we still have inside the bitterness and the rage and the anger and the despair. And St. Augustine says, for God to pour honey inside of your heart, first he has to take away the vinegar. Now, be sure that to forgive is impossible. It's something that comes from God. It's a gift. Some things are so hard that only can be forgiven through the grace of God. But just ask for this grace. Tell Jesus what happened. Tell the truth of why you're hurt. Tell why this heart doesn't heal. Tell him and allow him to perform the miracle, but do not retain it. Some sins, you're not to tell anyone else. Why? Because the only hands that can manipulate a sin, which is venom, are these hands. Not because I'm Superman. It's because these are Jesus' hands after the ordination. Only Jesus' hands can manipulate the sin. It's nobody else's business. Whatever happens in the confessionary stays between Jesus and you, let him defend you. Let him be the center of your life. Tell him all the truth. And from there, it is impossible not to be healed. It's impossible with time, because it takes time to dance. But you will learn how to. First, you will be like Frankenstein, but then it will get better, no? Because this is progressive. So let's really ask the Lord to prepare ourselves for this beautiful encounter with him in the sacrament of reconciliation. And of course, let us now hear beautiful stories of Sister Breeze telling us how this can become to life. Amen. Good evening, brothers and sisters. Wasn't that beautiful? Yes. Praise God. <clears throat> yes, I'm going to tell you two um, testimonies because they illustrate exactly what Father Pablo has just said about um, confession and the freedom that comes. And one happened um, many, many years ago um, through a person that I met and shared with me an extraordinary testimony. And I've been in so many countries, I can't remember which country, but this mother came to talk to me and she was telling me that her daughter was um, kidnapped and raped and murdered. And she was only something like 11 years old. And she, she talked about, you know, the rage and the anger. And she was a very devout Catholic. But she couldn't, she, like what Father was talking about, she hated. She was so angry at this person because it was, it was not a stranger in the area. It was somebody that um, she would have known them. But anyway, she was very, very angry. And uh, she went to confession and she told the priest, she said, you know, I come to confession, but I can't forgive. This is impossible. It's all right to talk about it. These things are nice to talk about, but when it hits home to your own child, <clears throat> and um, like my father said, the priest said to her, well, you know, Anne, it is impossible for you to forgive. It is impossible, but it's not impossible for God. Why don't you talk to him? And, you know, forgiveness is not a feeling. She said what she was feeling was the opposite. He said, forgiveness is not a feeling, so you have to will it, even though you feel like, you know, hate, murder, murder. 
And she said, you know, I kept praying, sister, and I kept going back to confession because, you know, it's a terrible thing to have this morning, noon and night in front of you, of uh, the tragedy and not being able to forgive. And of course, it affects your whole life. But she said she got a great grace and she told me she made a decision because she couldn't get it out of her mind that she was, it was just a feeling. And she said, I'm going to do something that seems impossible. And she told nobody. She went to the prison and she arranged to meet the murderer. And she said when she was going, every per part of her body was resisting it and she was angry. And she said she was taken in to this prison and this young man was there you know, um, with a guard in behind of her, looking miserable. And when he saw her, he was told that there was somebody coming to visit him. She said, you know, sister, the most extraordinary thing happened to me. I looked at him. He was miserable. He was in a terrible state. And she said, I got such pity for him. I will never forget looking at him. And it was almost as if it was my own child. I, was look I thought, what a young life. I know where my child is. But he is his whole life. And he had nobody, nobody came near him. He was disowned. And she said, you know, at the moment that I made the decision at, to go, it didn't leave me, the hatred, the anger. But when I did the action of going there, I had such a sympathy and a love for him. She said, you know what I ended up, sister, doing? I go visit him once a month, and I've become like a mother to him. That is impossible with humans, but not with God. And that's what Father was talking about tonight. You know, um, it seems impossible, which it is. But you know, Jesus can do, I mean, look at all the saints, look at all the people who did terrible things and how grace changes people. The other is a beautiful story that a priest, you know, I, Father Kevin that I worked with before, we were, we were giving um, a retreat and a very good friend of ours, a priest, was telling us uh, what happened during that year. He said that there were a group of priests, about five or six of them, who all went to seminary together and they would get together after Easter to um, just have a relaxing time and they'd have mass and share the homily and, uh, you know, share and recreate and pray. And he said one of the priests, one of his classmates, started bringing a priest with him that he was close to in his diocese. And this priest, um, would come every, for three years or four, he had been coming. But he was very quiet. He never uh, offered to, to be the main celebrant at the Mass. He, he never shared much. He seemed to be very, you know, quiet and timid and withdrawn. And, but they accepted him. And they just accepted him as he was. And he was never, they never put him under pressure. But he said, uh, this Father Jeff was telling me, he came this year, he said, and he was completely, he, something had happened to him, and we thought, you know, uh, what, whatever change took place in him. So the first day of their uh, few days, he offered to celebrate Mass and give the homily. And he said, I have something I want to share with you. And he said, he shared the following story, which he said, deeply changed his life, and of course the person he talked about. And he told how he was a priest up in the northern part of the United States, up on the East Coast. And one day he got a phone call from uh, out in the California someplace, asking him would he come to pray with uh, and visit a cousin of his who was on his deathbed. And they, he was very close to this cousin, so he arranged to go out to California. And when he arrived at the hospital where the cousin was, there was a little nun standing in the foyer of the hospital. And when she saw him standing there with her rosary beads, you know, 
And she said, oh, Father, I'm so delighted to see you. And, oh, she said, I prayed that somebody would come soon, a priest would come. And so she said, Father, in room four, there's a man, and he's here two months, and he's, he's really bad now. He's really sick. He's a Catholic. We know that much. But he's very bitter, very angry, and I have sent priests into him, and he curses at them, and he tells them to get out. And she said, it's really sad because he, has, he doesn't seem to want to talk to anybody. He, he's just here, and there's, he's, nobody ever visits him. And she said, the priests just walk out because he offends them. So she said, Father, I've been praying and praying for mercy for him. Is there any chance you'd go in and please don't leave? See if you can break this hard shell that's around him. So he was a kind of surprised, and he was in his he was young, he was in his late thirties, which is young. Anyway, he goes in and the man can hardly talk, he's very weak, but he made it clear that he didn't want him. And the man, the priest stood there and he said, Look at I'm only in, I'll give you a blessing. He said, I don't want any, I don't want to see any priest. And he said, leave. And he didn't leave. He just stood there. And he said, but wouldn't you let me say a prayer with you? Why are you so afraid? And then he looked at him. He said, God wouldn't want me. And he said, why would you say that? He said, of course God loves you. And the man looked at him and he said, I spent my life in jail. I'm only out a short time. And he said, I murdered a whole family. And he, he stopped. And the priest said to him, but you know, if you did, God can forgive you. You did your prison time. And then he said, when I was young, back some years ago, he said, I was a train switcher on the trains, you know, up in, in one of these big train stations. And he said, I took alcohol, I was an alcoholic, I drank, I got drugs. And he said, I went to work after a very, very bad weekend, a hangover. And I fell asleep and a train came and there was a young couple with three of their children and the train just demolished their car, they were killed. And uh, the priest is standing, looking at him, listening to him. And by this time, the man had broken because he had said what he did. You see, he never, nobody ever knew who he was, what much about him. And father looked at him and he said, was that we'd say in 1976 or whatever? And the man looked at him and he said, how do you know? What do you want to know for? How do you know the day? And the priest looked at him, he said, that was my father and mother, and my three brothers. He was a little boy of eight playing soccer. And on a Saturday morning or a Monday morning, whatever morning, his parents were bringing the three younger children to the grandparents. And he wasn't there, he was playing soccer. And they were killed. And he knew that it was a train wreck, but he never got the details or anything. And so he looked at the man and he told him, he said, they were my three brothers and my mom and dad. And he looked at the man in the bed who's dying and he said to him, but you didn't murder my parents. You had an addiction. There's a difference. And he said, you know, I'm the son of that couple and I forgive you, but I even have more. I'm a Catholic priest and I have been given by Jesus the power you have gone to confession to me and you have he lived with as father pablo said this was the hidden sin that he never confessed he was never able he was so scared so he spent his whole life in prison then he comes out and he gets bad cancer and he's about to die but you know what the beautiful part was that when Father talked to him about, about what he could do and the mercy of Jesus, the man pulled himself up and grabbed the priest. And there he confessed a life in the arms of the priest. And 
father was very moved and he said, when I was giving him absolution, something inside me happened. And at that moment, all I could think of was, here's one life. I live up in New Jersey or New York, wherever. And one life that Jesus wanted to save, he, he brought that priest all the way to California. And at the end, when he came out, he was very moved. The man was crying and thanking him and it was completely transformed. And he came out and he didn't tell his cousin. He went down to the room because he was so shook at the whole thing. But when he met the little nun, she took his two hands afterwards because she had gone in and the man was totally transformed and the bed smiling and uh, the fear had gone because fear is a terrible thing. And that's what guilt does to you. It makes you scared. And the little nun said to father, father, did you ever hear of the chaplet of divine mercy? I said it morning, noon and night since I met this prisoner. And I kept saying to Jesus, Jesus, you told Faustina that no sinner will die without the, your mercy through this chapel. And she said, you're the answer to my prayer. And I tell you that tonight because uh, everything that Father Pablo said is so true. And you know, I, I, the last thing I'd say to you, I was telling you this morning that in, in, 19, in the 1970s, I went to Rayford to the penitentiary of the prison. I was invited to go up to speak to the inmates, many of them on death row. And I, this is going back to the 70s. And I guess I spoke to them all about, I don't remember, but about Jesus and forgiveness. And I was there with the guards were with me, you know, and uh, I was in where they were locked up and I spoke to them about the mercy and forgiveness and about what could happen even though they were the terrible criminals. Do you know since that time there's one man writes to me he had a total conversion and now we're 20, 23 and he still writes to me and God bless him he sends me $25 every two months of his salary that he gets in the prison for my ministry. And he, he writes these most beautiful letters and he, he begged me with Father Pablo. He found out that Father Pablo and I, uh, you know, Father Kevin didn't know him at all and we never got a chance to go. But in the last year and a half or two years, he started begging me to come to the prison, that he had all these prisoners that he, he evangelizes in the prison. He must be 80 in his 80s because I mean, that's over, well over 30 years ago. So, on Holy Thursday, I get a message on my phone from the Bishop of the Diocese. In, it's in, in St. Augustine Diocese. And it was the Bishop saying, Sister Breed, if it's possible, go visit such and such a prisoner and the prisoners. In fact, he said, I'd like you to go to the three prisons, but weren't able. But he said, this prisoner went to the Bishop when he came to visit the prison and said, please, I would love to get Sister Breed and, and Father Pablo to come. And he's always telling me, please write another book. But I send him lots of books. But I was thinking today, just think, a life of misery through telling them about Jesus and talking about confession turned into a man who is in prison all his life, but he's a saint. And it, it was beautiful. And he talks about his freedom and about what Jesus does for him and about all the time he has, he does everything for Jesus. And that's why the biggest grace needed in the church and in the lives of people is to know the mercy of Jesus. And that's why Faustina's diary, it was so timely because we are at a time now when, you know, as Jesus said, this is the age of mercy. Justice will follow and it'll be too late. So I really encourage you tonight, you heard Father Pablo's beautiful invitation, and there are many priests here, and I'd like to say a prayer for these priests. Remember that the wonderful thing about the priest is that, as Father said, the priest sits on the throne of mercy, but it's not him, he disappears. And he himself has to, from the Pope to everybody, has to come to Jesus for mercy, because we're all sinners. And that's the beauty of it. So let's pray in thanksgiving. And tonight, 
you get the opportunity and the blessed sacrament will be exposed and I'd really encourage you you know to sit here and when you're preparing for confession pray for those in your family my own who don't go to confession who have lost the sense of sin and when you're you've finished your penance there's no end to the the ceremony you know when you've finished your penance and you spend the time with Jesus uh, it, it ends the, the confession tonight and then tomorrow morning we'll have um, mass and uh, the theme tomorrow is on the Holy Spirit and then tomorrow night there's also mass and both Father Pablo will be available tomorrow morning after the mass for confession and I'll be out um, at the table where I did this morning like to say a little prayer with you and sign a book or to talk to you for a few minutes but not tonight tonight we're concentrating on the celebration of God's mercy and I'm going to stay here and pray for you and for all the priests so let's pray Lord Jesus I thank you I thank you Jesus for your great love for us you who know that it is impossible for us Lord to accomplish any kind of healing without coming to you in humility and being willing to say I can't do it on my own you Lord are here waiting to give us mercy and compassion and healing I pray tonight Jesus for each of the priests here I thank you for the priesthood and we know Lord that the first thing you did over priests right after your resurrection your passion and death and resurrection was breathe on them and send your own Holy Spirit to give them your power that you would use them to forgive sin to liberate us so I pray that you Lord will bless each priest here tonight that you will use him powerfully in the confessional that you will anoint him with the wisdom and discernment that he needs as he hears and allows you Jesus to minister to your people and I ask you Mary our mother to please intercede for all of us I ask St. John Mary Vianney and all the great saints, Patrick Pio, that you would pray for us tonight, that we will experience God's mercy in abundance. We pray all of this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. God bless you.